Good morning, everyone, and uh, congratulations for, uh, for getting out of bed nice and early on day two, and your commute, which is probably longer than mine. I think maybe I win the award for the, the shortest commute. I live 500 yards in that direction. Um, it's pretty great, actually, to be able to just uh, walk across a car park and be at a conference. It makes a very pleasant change. Um, so, as, as Rachel mentioned, I'm from Booking.com. I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour of A-B testing this morning. Um, not a massive amount of time to go into, into too much detail, so come and find me uh, afterwards or in the breaks, and I'd be happy to talk to you in some more detail uh, and hear your thoughts as well. Um, as you'll see from A-B testing, opinion only counts for so much, uh, and mine doesn't count for any more than yours does, so it'd be great to hear some feedback from you guys. So, uh, this is me, Stuart Frisbee. I'm the principal designer at Booking.com. Uh, I joined in 2011. We had five designers when I joined. There's, uh, there's 106 designers now in our tech team, which is about 850 people, all based here in Amsterdam. Um, in fact, you may recognize our office. If you jumped on tram four at some point yesterday and went into the town, you will have come past our office on Rembrandt Plain. This is where all uh, 800 people in our IT department are based. Um, <laughs> So come by, have a coffee, give me a shout. I'd be, be delighted to show you around the office. So a little bit about Booking.com. Founded in 1996, we're a dinosaur in, in internet years. I was 11 years old when Booking.com launched. I wasn't working there at the time. Um, Planet Earth's number one accommodation website. So we have 820,000 properties online. Um, 12,000 employees in 150 offices around the world, a sales force, a customer service team, all the stuff you would expect from a huge e-commerce company. Our tech team's around 800 people, so we've got hundreds of Perl developers uh, since that's the, the, the base of our tech stack, and then, as I mentioned, about 100 designers working on the front end. Um, and we've been doing A-B testing for eight years, which also makes us kind of a dinosaur in that field as well. Um, so why do we do that? It's pretty simple for us. One of the core principles and the, the core cultures of our organization is that we want to be very customer-focused, and A-B testing is really a way for us to institutionalize that customer focus in a way that makes it very difficult for us to be anything else. All of the features that we deliver are designed and developed and tested in order to validate that they're actually better than what we've already got for customers. Um, and you'll see why we do that in a, in a few minutes. Let me step back just a little bit, and, and I'm going to give you a really puerile example of what A-B testing is in three minutes. Um, please don't do this kind of A-B testing. Uh, this, is, this is for demonstration purposes only. So, I'm not endorsing this. Please don't, uh, don't tweet that I suggested you should do this. So here's how A-B testing works. You start off with, with a hypothesis. You have an idea. You have a thought. Um, and in this case, the thought is that the color of the primary call to actions on our website are overpowered by other elements. Um, may sound familiar if you remember Douglas Bauman's 41 Shades of Blue story from when he left Google in disgust at their inability to understand design. Um, so you, you have a hypothesis. The next step is to figure out how you prove whether that hypothesis is true or not. And so we, we go through a process of metric setting. For us as an e-commerce company, that's pretty straightforward. That key metric is always, do we earn more money doing this or less? Um, but we've got a couple of metrics here, a shallow metric and a deep metric. Shallow, do more people click this button uh, once we've redesigned it than they do in, in the base version? And do those people uh, make more bookings, reservations, than the people who see the original version? So we've got metrics, we have a hypothesis, we'll move into a design phase, and, and here's, here's my awesome experiment, a green button versus a, a blue button. Um, and we're going to run this on our website. Millions of people are going to be exposed to this experiment, um, and we're going to assess the extent to which the hypothesis was true or false. And here's what that looks like. So again, deep and shallow metric. We can see clicks-wise that there's no difference between the, the base and the variant. 8.3% um, clicks in both. The interesting thing here is that in terms of conversion, we can see that there's a decrease in conversion from the treatment version. So the decision's pretty clear in this case. We, we keep the original version um, since more people make bookings. Again, puerile example. This is not the way we do A-B testing, but it's very easy to demonstrate this way. So experimentation is all about learning. And for us at Booking.com, we've been doing it for eight years. We've built up a corpus of really detailed and very specific knowledge about what works and doesn't work for our customer base. Um, our product is constantly changing. It's in flux. If you were to take all of the various variations of the website a customer could possibly see, it would be a number as long as my arm. Um, this can be very difficult if you come from a more traditional environment where you have top-down decision-making uh, long product roadmaps, those kind of things really don't work very well in an environment where you do A-B testing because my ideas and the ideas of management um, only last as long as a disproven hypothesis. So why should you be doing experiments? 
here's why I think you should be doing it. And again, this is all opinion. I haven't tested this hypothesis against not doing experiments for the last five years. Um, we're re really wrong most of the time. I've worked with 500 or so people at Booking.com in the last five years, and I've observed, designed, run, analyzed countless thousands of A-B tests. And the one universal truth is that most of us, or sorry, all of us, are wrong most of the time. And that's kind of troubling, because I built my career, and I think most of us build our careers on the basis that we're experts. Um, and nine times out of 10, it turns out that I actually don't know what I'm doing. Um, not everyone can exist in an environment like that, I understand. It's um, the constant crushing disappointment that comes from realizing you don't know what you're talking about uh, takes some getting used to. Um, we want our features to be profitable. As I mentioned before, our, our product should improve, and it should improve in a way that serves the business need. Um, we'd all like our website to do things which, which we think would be great and which would match the way we use the website. They tend not to represent the way customers use the website. It's in 42 languages. It's in 200 countries. Um, my assumptions as a white man in Europe um, are very often uh, flawed when we look at them on a global basis. So customer sentiment drives product development. Customers like what we're doing. We give them more of that. They don't like what we're doing. We give them less of that. Um, and therefore, product development is based on fact. It's not based on the fact that my CEO would like the logo to be bigger. Uh, or that the chief product officer would like me to introduce a complicated new feature. It's based on the fact that users are telling us that this is what they want. Conversely, why shouldn't you be experimenting? You need enough traffic to do an experiment. So Booking.com, that, that obviously long since stopped being a problem. We're able to detect very small changes with a very high statistical significance. So um, I know with, with a great deal of certainty the result of my experiment is reliable. Um, that reliability degrades as your traffic degrades. So if you have very few users, it's very difficult to do this kind of statistical uh, A-B testing. You also need metrics. Um, again, for us, very simple. The more people make a hotel reservation, the fewer people cancel a hotel reservation, things like that. Um, if your product doesn't have that key metric, A-B testing is not going to work. You're going to get a page full of data, and you're going to have to interpret it, at which point you've undermined the whole idea of doing A-B testing in the first place. And as I mentioned, if you like being the expert, maybe just don't do this at all, because uh, you're going to look like an idiot quite a lot. Uh, luckily for you, your colleagues are all going to look like idiots as well. Um, but it's, uh, as I said, it's a little bit painful. Um, so some common mistakes with A-B testing, um, and things that we see again and again, things that I've observed um, through being not only involved in A-B testing professionally, but I'm kind of sad in that it's kind of a hobby of mine uh, as well. I run A-B tests at home. I can tell you that my pasta carbonara is a constant disappointment. Um, <laughs> I haven't learned from that one. Um, so three common mistakes. Big shot A-B testing. This is the one that you probably see the most online when people talk about A-B tests. They take an entire page on their website or their mobile application, and they redesign, they redevelop, they add new features, they completely change it. And then they say, oh, we have a 4% significant uplift in people doing X. The problem there is they have no idea why that happened. They've made so many changes that they can't pick out the things that worked from the things that didn't work. Experimentation, again, for me, is all about learning and developing a corpus of knowledge that makes future experimentation more reliable. If you make too many changes at once, you've no idea uh, what knowledge to add to that corpus. Fringe A-B testing is the other one that you see a lot. The, the, probably the most common example of A-B testing that you see talked about is landing page redesigns. And they're generally things which are aimed towards getting more people to sign up for a, a, a software as a service product. That's great. Great. You're doing A-B testing. I think that's fantastic. But to me, A-B testing is a way to improve the customer experience and measure that through business metrics. If you're going to do A-B testing, you should do it across your entire product. Anywhere there's a customer pain point, an A-B test can help you eradicate that customer pain point. If all you're doing is increasing the velocity of your signups, uh, that experience is going to tail off pretty quickly when you get into opinion land of the actual product. The third one, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, is assumed reproducibility, which is a, a, a fancy way of saying that if your result says one thing, it doesn't necessarily mean that my result says another. What we see very often is that if I run a, a test on one part of Booking.com and the same test on another part of Booking.com, the result can be wildly different. Um, let's dig into a, my favorite example of this. Um, if you've been on the internet for the last two years, um, you'll probably recognize like this, the great hamburger debate, and it's still raging on, so I don't have a closed date on it. 
Um, and I'm not talking about the fact that processed meat gives you cancer, by the way, which is the worst news I've heard in, in probably 20 years. Um, I'm talking about this thing, um, which has been around since about 1981, and it's been used as a, uh, an icon that signifies a, a navigation menu or a list of options. And people have been arguing about it endlessly for years. Um, they present data, they present opinion, they pay, present fact in some cases. Um, and it's really troubling to me to see A-B testing being misused in this way. And let me explain why that is. Really smart people making very strong assertions, like the hamburg hamburger menu doesn't work. That's Luke Robluski, who I think is, is a phenomenally talented person, and, I, and I, I love the work that he does. Other people saying, obvious always wins, the hamburger menu never will. Someone else saying why to avoid and how, why and how to avoid hamburgers, all based on this idea that the hamburger menu doesn't work and can never work. Um, I can tell you we tested it as well. It worked fine, but again, that's really not the important part here. Robbed of context, the result of an experiment is a fart in the wind. It doesn't matter what result you got. It has no bearing on the result I'm going to get when I run the same experiment on my website. So when you see people saying, booking.com has proven the hamburger menu is, uh, is fine as a navigation controller, that's also nonsense. Here's the hierarchy of, uh, oh, other way. Here's the hierarchy of reliable data sources. One, your own experiment data. You know your product, you know your technical setup, you know your metrics, run your own experiments, get your own results. If you can't do that for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, trust your own opinion. Yes, you're gonna be wrong most of the time, but so is everyone else. You know more about your customers than some guy writing on the internet does. Um, and then after that, take someone else's opinion, because that opinion is going to be based on your product rather than their experiment on their product. Trusting someone else's experiment data really is the, the least reliable way to run A-B tests and, and to do feature development in a data-driven way. So what does A-B testing look like when it's done right? And again, done right in my opinion. Um, We've been doing it for eight years. We've learned a lot. We've made countless mistakes. Um, but these are the things that, that we kind of take to heart as, as learned knowledge from this very hard fought process that we've been going through. First up, test everything. As I mentioned before, um, there are pain points every step of your product, and A-B testing can help you eradicate them. Um, if you just test your landing page again, are you really making the experience better for your customer, or are you just generating more sign-ups? It's a short-term versus a long-term view of customer engagement. Test atomically. This is the opposite of big bang A-B testing. Test one thing at a time, build your knowledge, and build your product in a way that data tells you you should build the product. This is the reliable way of doing A-B testing. It's slow, yes, especially in mobile apps where release cycles define that you can only do a certain amount of testing per release. But if you don't do it this way, then you're forking off in a direction that, that you can't really rely on. Build your own testing tools. There are things you can, you can use online, third-party testing tools. They have no idea how your product works. They don't understand the complexities of the metrics you're tracking. Um, Performance-wise, they're always going to be a drain because they're built for everyone, not built for you. Um, build stuff you can trust or fix, is, is my opinion. We have some of our best engineers working on our testing tools, and that's for very good reasons. Question stuff you don't understand. Data is difficult. Um, I am terrible at mathematics, uh, and even worse at statistics. Luckily, I'm surrounded by people who are very good at that stuff. And in asking questions about how these things work, I develop some knowledge which helps me to be better at A-B testing. Perhaps most cr cult uh, critically is to build a culture of data-driven product development. Um, once you've got that culture in place and people are excited about the idea of being data-driven and knowing what customers want when they come to use your service, you're going to take off in a, in a way that Booking.com did. Um, again, thousands of experiments that we're running, and we have a really vibrant environment where people are excited about being able to solve and prove that they've solved customer problems. Hire entrepreneurs. Um, for us, that's really important. We want people who buy into this idea and people who are really going to go after solving some of these problems. And perhaps the best part of it, I talked a lot about proving yourself wrong. You also get to prove everyone else wrong. Um, my CEO has countless opinions about how a product should work, and there's no greater delight than me walking into his office on a Monday morning with a piece of paper and telling him he was wrong. Um, I really encourage you to, to try that out. Um, you get to prove the industry wrong as well, which is always nice. Um, and you get to prove yourself wrong, which um, you'll get used to after a while. So that's my whistle-stop tour of A-B testing, the do's and don'ts, the hard lessons I've learned at Booking.com. Um, enjoy the rest of your day uh, and the conference, and I really look forward to speaking to some of you uh, in the break. Thank you.